My name is Warren Ponder. I'm a director of product management in our end user computing division. And my team primarily focuses on the remote experience components that are available through end user computing products from our group. Also with me is Lawrence and Benit. You guys want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Lawrence Bracklin. I'm in the uh, performance team, and we've been working on PCYP performance for the last uh, you know, year or so or more. Okay. Yeah, myself, Banit Agrawal, also working in the performance team on PCYP performance. Great. So just as a reminder, this session may contain product features that currently are under development. This is not by any means a commitment that anything that we hear about today may or may not be available in, in future VMware products. So let's look, let's look a little bit at what we're going to cover today. We'd like to touch a little bit on end-user computing trends. We'll touch just briefly on what's new with VMware View 5.0. And then we're going to go into deep detail about what performance improvements were made with PCIe-IP with View 5.0. We'll talk a little bit about our own internal testing performance results that we found while developing enhancing PCIe-IP for View 5.0. We'll talk a little bit about some best practices. And finally, we'll wrap up with some conclusions. OK, so let's go ahead and start. And let's look at end-user computing trends and what's new with VMware View 5.0. It's pretty clear that what we're seeing is this clicker is really sensitive. It's pretty clear that what we're seeing is the end of the Windows-only, PC-only era. New device proliferation is happening all across IT organizations. End users are expecting and demanding anywhere, anytime access. It's not uncommon for, multiple u for users to be interfacing and accessing and using multiple different devices to access both applications, information, and data across your enterprise. More and more frequently, end users are bringing their own personal devices into the enterprise, connecting them to enterprise environments, and accessing applications, information, and data. Another trend that we're also seeing happen more and more is rich application diversity via SaaS, or cloud-based delivered applications. Whether it's social media, mobile applications, on-demand applications, or even more frequently, applications that are completely underneath the radar of the IT organization that users are going out and acquiring themselves to become more productive that may or may not actually be condoned or supported by IT organizations. But this creates a challenge because IT organizations are faced with trying to manage and control these applications. So although we see these trends happening, we still believe that Windows applications will continue to remain as part of the mix of what IT organizations have to deliver to their end users. Well beyond 2014, we believe that IT organizations will be required to deliver both Windows-based applications as well as a Windows-based desktop experience well beyond 2014. Many of the reasons for this are several of these applications could simply be hard to convert applications that you can't move to a new environment. There could be custom applications that were developed in-house by an existing organization, and you simply haven't had the time, resources, or the budget to actually move these custom applications to a new platform. There could be existing older applications that provide a mission critical or critical component to the business that you also are not ready to move forward into a new environment. There could be multi-tier applications, and there also could be browser-specific applications that might actually be tied to a specific browser version or even tied to some underlying dependency of the operating system itself. So a key component of VMware's end-user computing vision is how do we take customers and IT organizations that are living in a PC-only era 
and help them move towards this any device, any access era as more and more users are accessing applications differently and bringing different devices into the enterprise. More importantly, how do we help you deliver a Windows-based... Sorry, I'm about to get rid of this laptop. How do we, how do we help... <laughs> this is a killer. Try this one more time. How do we help you guys deliver that... experience, that Windows-based experience and applications while maintaining control. So let's talk a little bit about what's new with VMware View 5, which actually helps you guys start to be able to deliver a Windows-based desktop experience while also, man, this is a killer, while also taking into account these existing applications that you're being forced to deal with, as well as new devices that are coming into an environment through your organizations. One of the, one of the first capabilities I'd like to talk about, which is, a, which is a very unique capability that's available through VMware View 5.0, is View Media Services for 3D Graphics. This is phase one of a three-phase graphic strategy that we've been working on inside VMware. Essentially, what we're providing is a non-hardware accelerated 3D graphics experience, which allows you to start delivering basic 3D applications that require DirectX or OpenGL 2.1 capabilities to have those applications work and function. An example of that is now, using this new unique capability, you can deliver a full Arrow Windows desktop experience to any one of your devices. In addition, you can deliver basic 3D applications that require DirectX or OpenGL. Now, this is not targeted at high-end workstation class workloads. This is really targeted at task-based, knowledge worker-based workloads that require just basic application 3D capabilities just to keep some of these applications relevant. A few examples are Google Earth, Arrow, Office 2010, which has new 3D capabilities, and even more and more frequently, browsers are requiring or taking advantage of 3D rendering capabilities. What's really unique and great about this new capability is there's no client-side dependencies on the client endpoint. We can deliver a basic 3D experience to any client device, whether it's a zero client, thin client, or a VMware View client that's using the mobile, our mobile client. There's also no requirement for any physical GPU on the client side or the server side. So what this means is to deliver a basic 3D application capability, your IT organization is not required to go out and buy any specialized physical GPUs or new server systems to account for those GPUs that have to go into those systems. You can do all that with the existing systems that you've made investments in today. Another unique capability that's being delivered with VMware View 5 is View Media Services for Unified Communications. Essentially, what we're delivering here is a set of APIs that we've delivered to our key unified communication partners, which allows them to move the voice and video decoding down to the client endpoint for media processing. What's great about this is the application UI still remains inside the virtual desktop system. So that's where you install, manage, and maintain the application. However, if I'm going to set up a call between myself and someone else, as a user, I'll interact with the user interface of my UC suite or soft phone inside my virtual desktop. But when the call is set up and established, the call will actually be point to point between my client and your client, where the media processing will actually happen on the client endpoint. What's really great about this is by providing this capability with our UC partners, we're able to provide the most highly scalable, high-performance voice and video solution because all the media processing is living outside in the distributed network rather than contained back in the data center where hairpinning can occur and, con and con contention can occur with the virtual desktop systems. 
Another great benefit is IT organizations continue to leverage their existing voice over IP infrastructure that they've made investments in over the last 10 to 15 years. There's no need or requirement to go make major architecture network changes to your voice over IP QoS systems or anything of that nature because the client endpoint essentially is acting just like a hard phone would act today. Another great exciting capability is we're adding a new thing for VMware View and user experience monitoring. Essentially what's being provided here is a per session statistic capability that allows administrators to get granular visibility into the performance characteristics of what's happening with PC over IP as well as any network impact that may be happening or occurring on the network in addition to visibility into anything that's happening with the view system. Through PC over IP, essentially what we're delivering is 30 individual granular statistics that allow you to get a lot of data and information about what the user might be experiencing or what might actually be happening with any user's individual session. So for example, a few things that you can collect from this are things like what's the average bandwidth utilization that's being used by PC over IP? What do we see as the latency that's actually happening on that session or on that network connection that the user might, have, might be having problems with? How's USB performing? How much bandwidth are the devices using? How's audio performing? What bandwidth is it using? What's the frame rate that PC over IP is delivering at any given time? So this is very granular, detailed information. What's great about this capability is it's extremely flexible because it's been implemented using WMI interfaces. So an administrator could actually do something as simple as basic as some very easy WMI scripting to just gather information and data from a PC over IP session. They could use a tool as simple and as basic as Perfmon to get a graphical visual view into what might actually be happening with a PC over IP session. In addition, there will also be robust enterprise integration capabilities that will be happening with products such as VMware vCenter operations. So VCOps will actually, in a future release, be integrating all these PC over IP statistics into their dashboard view so that you can get a graphical picture of what's happening at a very granular level across your entire virtual desktop system. If you want to see a demo of this, you can actually go by the VMware booth. But this is actually not exclusive to VMware. In addition, we have a broad ecosystem of partners. I have a ghost slide runner. In addition to um, our partner ecosystem, there's three partners that have already started working on integrating these capabilities with their enterprise management capabilities as well. So partners that you might be familiar with, such as Liquidware Labs, Lakeside Software, and Splunk will all be bringing products to market that provide you an enterprise dashboard view that allows you to quickly troubleshoot, monitor, and solve problems related to remote virtual desktop sessions. Another capability that's being delivered is what we call PC over IP continuity services. This is a pretty exciting capability because essentially what happens is PC over IP will auto detect a loss in network connectivity. So this is, this is very helpful, particularly in use cases where you might have a lossy network, such as a Wi-Fi network, or even a 3G network, where you might have packet loss or intermittent drops in network connectivity. So what will happen is when PC over IP detects that, for up to 30 seconds it will try and reestablish the network connection or reestablish its connection with the session so that the user doesn't have to be interrupted and go all the way back through the connection process to get reestablished with their virtual desktop. This is completely seamless to the user and not something that they have to interact with or deal with. It helps reduce interruption to them, ultimately leading to increased productivity. So a really common use case that I like to describe where this is very helpful and where we see it quite a bit and where we got a lot of requests for this is in the healthcare space. So quite frequently, a doctor might actually be using the VMware View client for an iPad or the VMware View client for Android, where he's doing, de where he's doing bedside consultation with, you know, with his consultation customers, and he may go from room to room to room. In addition, he may actually go from floor to floor. 
So today, if a doctor goes into, a, into an elevator, he will actually lose network connectivity and his connection will drop with his virtual desktop. By adding this new capability, he has the possibility of going to the elevator, going from floor to floor, and then within 30 seconds, his session will automatically be reestablished. So this essentially means he doesn't have to go back through the whole process of launching the view client, getting authenticated, selecting his virtual desktop, and then getting reconnected to his session. So the reason why we're primarily here today is really to take a deep dive into what are the PC over IP performance optimizations that were made in VMware View 5.0. So before we go into deep granular detail about the specifics of, of what's going to be delivered, I did want to give just a brief overview and a, and a high-level perspective of exactly the main areas that we focused on and what will be available. The first area is our lossless codec optimizations. So we worked closely with Teradici to make improvements and enhancements to the lossless codec that's used for handling text, particularly rich text, in a virtual desktop session with PC over IP. It's not uncommon for things like clear type fonts and rich fonts to actually consume as high as 24% bandwidth regardless of what remoting protocol you're using. These rich fonts are very bandwidth intensive and have been for quite some time. So we've made significant changes to the lossless codec to improve the bandwidth utilization when using these rich fonts. We've also added two new configurable protocol settings, the first being client-side caching. Client-side caching essentially caches desktop composition or imaging components of the desktop composition in a client-side cache. So things that do not frequently change, such as a Windows taskbar, can actually be displayed and presented back to the user from a local client cache rather than retransmitting the pixels back across the network, which ultimately will result in fewer and less bandwidth utilization. A new, another thing that we've actually added is the ability to disable build to lossless. One of the unique differentiated capabilities about PC over IP is it is always provided a lossless experience. This is very critical in being able to provide the most extreme rich experience that a lot of users actually demand. So by default, because this is so important, we're gonna, we're gonna actually leave this on by default. But in some environments, your users may not require a fully lossless experience. So in those environments, if you feel like you don't need a fully lossless experience, there's now the ability to disable build to lossless which in certain situations will actually help you reduce your bandwidth utilization. What's great about all the capabilities, just like we've done in the past, is we continue to provide GPOs to manage and control all these settings. So if you have different environments or you have different configurations where you want to provide different settings, it's very easy to simply apply the GPO settings to manage these new protocol capabilities, both at the user level or the computer level, depending upon how you choose to deploy them and manage them. At the end of the day, all these capabilities will ultimately result in reduced bandwidth utilization, which in turn is going to result in increased scalability of your WAN links, as well as higher user density of your WAN links. So on that note, let's go ahead and take an extreme deep dive into the real granular specifics of the PC over IP protocol improvements that will be added in View 5.0. Lawrence? Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. So basically, as Warren was saying, I'm going to start looking at the, uh, the details of PC IP, talking about the detailed enhancements and the benefits that we see from that. But before I dive into the details, I just want to sort of throw up a initial chart to sort of show us all where we're focusing, where all uh, PCIP falls in the larger view um, architecture. So here, as you all know, we have our virtual desktop. It's running on an ESX box in your, in your data center in the cloud, wherever it is, somewhere remote. And we're going to connect to it via our client device. As Warren mentioned again, that can be pretty much anything. It can be a thin client, a zero client, a laptop, a tablet, a desktop. And basically, in our desk, oh, we're going to connect over the, the, uh, the network, obviously. Um, in our um, virtual desktop, we have the view agent. Part of the view agent itself that's running in that desktop VM is the PCIP, PCIP encoder. On the client side, 
part of the View client application, which you're going to use to actually uh, connect to your desktop, is the PCIP decoder. And these two talk directly with each other. And basically, this is what we're going to be focusing on. We're going to be focusing on reducing the overheads associated with the encoder and uh, decreasing the uh, bandwidth associated with the encoder and the decoder communicating with each other. So basically, as you guys all know, PCIP is a remote display excuse me, remote display protocol. It's the primary remote display protocol in VMware View. And basically, as such, it's responsible for capturing the audiovisual output from the remote desktop and delivering it to the client device. Um, it's also responsible for making sure that USB communication um, is, success is successful, that um, keystrokes, that mouse movements are relayed to the client also. And it's responsible for doing this um, efficiently and delivering good user experience, by which I mean it should be snappy, it should feel responsive, and also, um, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, it should just feel responsive, essentially. So, um, and it's really responsible for doing this irrespective of what the user is actually running on their desktop. It could be something as simple as a text application, or at the other end of the spectrum, it could be something like, you know, high-end graphics, motion video. And in all of these cases, PCIP is responsible for delivering that content efficiently, and delivering a good user experience. And so as a result, it's not surprising that it is a multi-codec protocol. It has risk, risk, rich desktop imaging applications, it, algorithms, and it supports both lossy and lossless compression. And basically, PCYP in real time dynamically is monitoring the screen, the desktop screen, monitoring the desktop content, and figuring out which is the appropriate algorithm, which is the optimal algorithm to apply at any given point in time. And also it has to do this, you know, whatever network the user is running over, be it an extreme WAN with, you know, fairly modest bandwidth, you know, hundreds of kilobits and a very high latency, you know, hundreds of milliseconds, or, you know, virtually unconstrained bandwidth in sort of the uh, corporate LAN environment. And so again, it's monitoring the available bandwidth and it's configuring those algorithms to deliver the best possible user experience given the current resource constraints. So if you're in a lower bandwidth environment, it may be taking down the frame weight, it may be tweaking down the image quality slightly, but again, it's basically dynamically optimizing the experience. And we can see that a little more graphically on the next slide here. Basically, we have a user desktop, and you know, maybe it's a little more cluttered than most, but essentially it gets the, the picture across, which is, you know, it's composed of many different types of content. I mean, you can have Icons, you can have graphics, you can have motion video, you can have text, you can have photos. And PCIP is, as I said, looking at all these different regions of the screen and figuring out what is the correct codec at this point in time to apply to that region of the screen. And then also, it is monitoring the, the network bandwidth and then configuring those algorithms to ensure the best possible user experience, whether you be running in the WAN, whether you be running in the LAN, and also if you encounter sort of um, dynamic um, bandwidth restrictions. So say there is some network congestion, PCIP will seamlessly you know, decrease the bandwidth, you know, scale back the frame rate, decrease the image quality until that congestion is resolved, and then it will seamlessly bring the, the user quality back up again. So with that said, let's dive into the optimizations themselves. These fall into two basic categories. CPU optimizations, where we focused on reducing the overhead associated with PCIP, and bandwidth optimizations, where we focused on reducing the bandwidth consumed by PCIP. So we're going to focus first on CPU, and just to sort of make sure we're all on the same page about where we're focusing, Let's go back to that initial diagram that I threw up. And we have actually spent some time optimizing the PCIP decoder as well. But for this talk, we're going to be focusing on the encoder. So basically, it's the encoder that's running in the virtual desktop in the ESX box in the data center. And so we've had a significant effort um, optimizing this. We've had a lot of people looking at this, spending a lot of time and effort trying to remove all of the overheads associated with PCIP. One of the cases we've looked at is the idle desktop CPU optimization. And so what does that mean? Well, if you think about the way that the user interacts with their desktop, you know, when the screen changes, when a web page loads, there's a flurry of activity. 
then, you know, especially from the, the CPU's perspective, there's a period of idleness while the user reads that page, while the user takes a phone call, thinks about what to write, goes in a bathroom break. And so there's a lot of idle time. PCIP is still running in the background at that point. It's still monitoring the bandwidth. It's still doing bookkeeping, you know, accounting. It's got a keep alive handshake with the client device, you know, all good stuff that needs to go on. But we wanted to make sure that basically it uses the absolute minimum possible CPU. So we went back in, we've examined those code paths, and we've really you know, optimized the heck out of it. And basically, we can say that you know, in these cases now, we're seeing negligible CPU overhead from PCOIP. The other thing we've done is we've basically gone and looked at the bandwidth associated with that handshake keep alive that's going on between the desktop and the client. And again, we've optimized it further and taken about 50% you know, reduction, so about half the bandwidth associated with that. So that's what we've done on the idle desktop case. We've also spent a lot of time you know, act, um, optimizing the active case where PCYP is doing its heavy lifting. Um, and we've done a number of things here. We've basically looked at the hot functions in PCYP. In some cases, we've actually tweaked the algorithms themselves to make them more efficient. In other cases, we've looked at the implementation of those algorithms and made them more efficient, sometimes even going down to the assembly level to actually sort of hand code it, get that last few percent of overhead out of PCYP. The other thing we did as well is we've made more extensive use of SSE. As you guys can imagine, the type of imaging operations that PCYP is doing is very amenable to acceleration via SIMD instructions like SSE, which is available on you know, x86 processors. Um, PCYP was previously um, SSE optimized, but what we've done is we've gone back in, we've expanded that coverage, and we've started using some of the newer SSE instructions as well. So we're now using up to SSE 4.2 when you run on the processor that is capable of supporting those instructions. I keep getting feedback from this one, I think. Um, the other thing we've done is just, you know, we make use of compression uh, optimized compression libraries wherever possible. And, you know, what I'm trying to generally convey here is we spend a lot of time and effort looking at every conceivable aspect of PCYP and really trying to reduce the CPU overheads. And I think you guys will see when you run it, and we'll also talk to it a little bit later in the uh, presentation as well, that you will notice that the overheads are significantly lower than previously. And there's a couple of significant benefits to that. First and foremost is increased consolidation ratios. You know, if I'm taking less CPU cycles to support a user's desktop VM, I can obviously stack more desktop VMs per core, more desktop VMs per system. And so if I'm trying to support a set number of VDI users, I can now do so with less hardware, you know, which delivers direct cost savings. The other thing we've done as well is you know, we've optimized the overhead on the client, we've optimized the overhead on the host, and so you're obviously going to see improved response times. It's going to feel snappier. We've improved user experience as well, and we'll see some of those results later as well in the presentation. So let's switch gears now and talk about the bandwidth optimizations that we've introduced with PCYP. Um, again, let's just focus in, going back to this old diagram, sort of illustrating here that, you know, no surprise, we're focusing on the bandwidth that's going between the encoder and the decoder. Most of the bandwidth is coming from the encoder and being pushed to the decoder, so we're focusing on there. The optimizations that we've undertaken are equally applicable to both the LAN and WAN use cases, but obviously the WAN, where bandwidth is much more constrained, it's a much more precious resource, is where, we've really, you know, where people really care about it. But WAN is not really a single homogeneous thing. Rather, it's a broad spectrum of networks, ranging from the high end, sort of the corporate WAN, where you have, you know, you've got decent bandwidth and a lowish latency, right through to the other end of the spectrum, where you have, you know, what can sort of be cutely called extreme WAN, um, something like an overseas um, call center. You have very modest bandwidth, you know, a few hundred kilobits maybe, as little as that, very high latency, hundreds of milliseconds. And it's also potentially highly shared. You've got a lot of dudes trying to use the same WAN link. And in previous iterations, we've played very nicely in the sort of higher end of the WAN spectrum. But with the optimizations we're introducing with View 5, you know, we're going to have efficient and beautiful coverage of the entire WAN spectrum, right? So we're really going to be able to take it out to the extreme WAN and deliver, you know, really nice um, results, very good quality, very responsive look and feel, even in very, very constrained bandwidth. So what have we done to actually achieve that? Whereas, as Warren alluded to, we've improved our lossless compression algorithm. And again, as he was mentioning, is if you go back to the user's desktop, there's a lot of text content, right? I mean, there's text in PowerPoints, there's text in your PDFs, in your, 
in your mail, in your web pages. And if you try to compress text with a lossy algorithm, you know, quite quickly you end up with sort of blurred edges and artifacts and halos, and it's a very unpleasant experience. So predominantly, text is compressed losslessly. And so, you know, given its importance, we've improved our algorithm. It's delivering improved compression ratios. It's a lot more robust than previously. And also, as you know, again, Warren touched upon, we're actually seeing about a 2x improvement in the compression of anti-alias fonts. And so if you go back to your desktop again, so typically for an office worker or a knowledge worker, think about the amount of text that's on that screen. You can imagine that a lot of the data that's coming over the wire to the user, to the client device, is actually losslessly encoded. It's losslessly encoded text. And therefore, it's no surprise that we're seeing about a 30 to 40% bandwidth improvement from this optimization alone. The other thing we've done is we've introduced, as Warren said, client-side image caching. So again, if you think about that desktop, there's a lot of temporal redundancy in the data that's coming over the wire from the host. So again, if we hang on to it on the client side, we can reuse it and save it being retransmitted. So essentially what's happening on the host now is as soon as you actually see a screen update, the host goes and queries its shadow copy of the client's cache, figures out whether the client has that line, has that um, image block in its cache. If it does, it merely sends over the wire a cache index now. So you can, you, know, you can see that that's obviously a lot more efficient than re-encoding and sending the entire image block. And so again, it should come as no surprise that from this optimization, we're seeing about a 30% bandwidth improvement for your typical office knowledge worker workflow. Happily, these gains are largely additive. So when we add these two, gain, these two optimizations together, we're seeing cumulative benefits of about 60% out of the box. So you know, a very nice reduction in bandwidth utilization. And you know, a couple of key benefits, again, improved response times. It obviously takes time, especially in the WAN networks, to send all of that data all of, over the link. So if we're sending less of it, you know, things are going to feel snappier, improved user experience. The other thing, as Warren touched upon, is if we're taking less bandwidth to support a given VDI session, we can support more VDI sessions for, um, you know, for any given WAN network. And so our WAN scalability also improves significantly as well. So basically, I should say that that is all out of the box uh, goodness. No impact on image quality at all. The image quality is unchanged from previous iterations. The other thing that we've done with View 5 is we've introduced the ability to do, for users to actually fine tune their image quality. And as you guys probably know, by default, PCUIP will build to a lossless state. So Warren touched on this. So essentially what happens is, if there's a screen update, PCUIP immediately sends across an initial image to the client device, gets something up on the client device as soon as possible. Then, in rapid succession, it refines that image. It builds that image until we reach a high quality, yet lossy image on the client device. If the screen remains unchanged, PCUIP in the background will continue to build that image until it reaches a fully lossless state on the client. Now again, as we talked to already, excuse me, in many application spaces, for instance, healthcare, this is a very important feature. They love this feature. They love this, you know, this lossless feature. But in other application spaces, say if I'm just hacking on a PowerPoint presentation, it's going to be very difficult for me to even discern the difference between perceptually, lo between perceptually lossless and uh, the lossless. Perceptually lossless being the sort of PCUIP vernacular for that high-quality lossy image. And so you can imagine that basically, you know, by providing the ability to turn this off in application spaces where it's not really essential, where it's actually difficult to even discern the benefit, we're going to see a very significant bandwidth saving. It's about 30% for a typical office worker. Um, you know, with, in many cases, no, perceptual, you know, no perceptible impact on image quality. And before I leave this, so, uh, yes, sorry, the big number. <laughs> I, fl I fluff the big number. Um, so yeah, basically, if we, take, if we take this optimization and combine it with the stuff we've seen before, we're seeing about a 75% reduction in bandwidth. Um, again, mileage will vary, blah, blah, blah. But nevertheless, for typical office workers, for knowledge workers, we do see this number, and we've seen it in a bunch of different usage scenarios. Before I leave this topic, one thing I did want to mention was really just how difficult it can be to even discern the difference between perceptually lossless and lossless. So here we have a couple of screenshots of um, you know, a Windows logo and some text. And basically, we've got to zoom in 
Um, and on the first line, the zoom is for PCYP operating in the default lossless mode. In the second line, PCYP is operating in the no build to lossless. It's in the perceptually lossless mode. And it's virtually impossible to even discern any difference. And so I think in a lot of application spaces, it's possible to turn this off, get the bandwidth savings without any impact on image quality. And so to summarize my portion of the talk at least, we've introduced a lot of enhancements with PCYP and View 5. We've significantly streamlined PCYP. We significantly reduced the overheads. And as we'll see later in the presentation, our overheads are now significantly or appreciably lower than competing protocols in many cases. We've delivered significant bandwidth reductions. It's about 2.5x by default, straight out of the box, no impact on image quality at all. You can increase that to about a 4x reduction in bandwidth utilization for those application spaces where it's OK to turn off build to lossless. And you know, there's a, a lot of them. And so as you'd expect, it, you know, it basically gives us improved user experience, improved responsiveness, improved consolidation ratios, and improved WAN scalability. So basically now we've looked at what we're doing at the low level, at the protocol level, the, the gains we're seeing at the low level. I'll now turn over to Benit, who will talk about how this translates into application level performance benefits. Uh, thanks, Lawrence, uh, for giving a nice overview on the bandwidth and the CPU optimization that we have done in the upcoming View 5 overlays. And now I'm going to talk about some of the performance results. So I'll take a, a typical VDI user workload, uh, which simulates your day-to-day -day, uh, office user activities and uh, present some of the comparative results comparing View 5o with the prior View 4.5 release. And then I'll present some of the performance results comparing different display protocols like Citrix, HDX, and then as well as comparing RDP7. And then, then finally, I'll present some of the results on multi-VM run, so presenting how much extra host consolidation that you can see. And finally, at the end, I'm going to present some of the best practices that you can deploy or apply to your VDI deployment. So to start with, let me give you a flavor of the experimental setup here. So we have used IBM Blade with 2.53 gigahertz Hopper Town processor. Uh, the box has 32 gig RAM. It's connected to a NFS storage array. Uh, so the hypervisor vSphere 4.1 for View 4.5 and View uh, vSphere 5.0 for View 5.0. And the desktop VM that we have used here is 32-bit Windows 7 VM. It's with one vCPU, one gig of RAM, and the screen resolution that is used is 1152 by 864. This is connected, uh, again, with PCYP with build to lossless off, so it is building it to the perceptually lossless quality. And the client side, we have XP with one vCPU, 768 meg of RAM, and the same resolution. And as expected, we will be running VDI on a different network conditions. So for example, you will be like if you are a branch office, you will be connecting over a WAN. Let's say if you have like maybe like continental, you will be like connecting over a uh, extreme WAN conditions. So for LAN, we have the same as LAN settings like 100 Mbps with 1 millisecond latency. WAN, we have 2 Mbps network connection with 100 millisecond latency. And in extreme WAN, where we have very low bandwidth, uh, 300 kbps network connection with 100 millisecond network latency. Now let's look at the workload that we have used. Uh, so what do you use in your day-to-day -day activities, like as a typical Office user? You use Office apps, like you use PowerPoint, Excel, Word. Uh, use other apps, PDF for PDF browsing, Internet Explorer, Firefox for browsing, uh, Window Media Player for watching videos. So View Planner simulates all this application. So it simulates some of the operation, like for example, opening a PowerPoint, doing the slideshow, and then closing the presentation. So it simulates this set of operation with all this typical Office user workload. So what a View Planner does is, so you can use this tool to do your platform characterization. So for example, you want to find out how many VMs per core I want to run. So you can use this tool to see and characterize your hardware architecture. For example, if you want to see how much memory overcommitment can I do, so you can see, use this tool and figure out uh, how much memory overcommitment can you do. And if you want to find out 
how many read IOPS, write IOPS is going uh, to your backend storage array, like per user. Then you can do this, like whether it is 10 IOPS per VM or whether it is 8 IOPS per VM. So you can do this kind of analysis with View Planner. And for example, uh, another use case is if you want to characterize the end user experience, right? So you want to see how much time does it take for a PowerPoint to open or how much time does it take for PDF to browse, right? If you want to visit the next page, like how much time does it take from the end user side? So we have patented watermarking techniques which actually precisely qualifies the end user experience. On top of that, another couple of use cases would be to find out, uh, like if your hardware is uh, good enough to scale, let's say, 1,000 desktop for a particular hardware. So you can do those analysis, see if your hardware, uh, how it is characterizing with this kind of workload. So, and for our analysis, we have used all application, so all the Office apps, uh, PDF, Firefox, and with a think time of 20 seconds. More details on this view planner tool will be on another talk. Uh, it will be today at 4.30 and then uh, tomorrow at 4 o'clock. And along with this view planner, we also have a lot of uh, platform improvements, other view 5.0 improvements uh, that we have done. So more details will be in this talk. And uh, if you want to see live in action, I would encourage you to go to the VM uh, where PSO booth to check uh, View Planner, uh, the latest version, uh, live. So with that, uh, so what are the useful metrics we all care about, right? So for example, if you have a VDI deployment, you certainly want to maximize your uh, user experience so that your VDI users are happy, right? As well as you want to minimize the resource consumption so that you can save cost for your VDI deployment. So what does this translate to? This translates to that you minimize the response time of your applications so that you have a better user experience. You want to minimize the bandwidth usage and as well as you want to minimize the CPU usage so that you can maximize the user experience so users are happy and you can minimize the cost. So this translates it to the, this three metrics, response time, bandwidth usage, CPU usage. That we will be focusing for the rest of the session. So now let's look at the user experience chart here. On the left, you see the legend. So I'll be talking, following this legend for what metrics it's talking about. So here in this case, it's user experience of the response time. On the y-axis, you see the normalized response time. On the x-axis, you have three network conditions, LAN, WAN, and extreme WAN. The purple color here shows view 4.5 and the view 5.0 is represented using blue color. So now if you look at the response time here, if you look at view 4.5 extreme WAN, which is the purple color here, is has the highest response time. So that is our baseline in this case. That is normalized with 1.0 and everything is scaled with respect to that. So now if you look at the LAN and WAN results, both view 4.5 and 5.0, we see there is very, sing very less noticeable difference in the user response time. So we don't see much difference in the response time and the user experience in LAN and WAN. But if, if we move to extreme WAN, we see that there is about 15% improvement in the user experience, 15% lower response time. Why do we see, don't see the difference in the LAN and WAN and why do we see in extreme WAN? The fundamental is that we have minimized the bandwidth usage and view planner in general, we have seen that it takes about less than 200 kbps on bandwidth. So we don't see that much uh, significant difference in view LAN and WAN, but we see that about in extreme WAN. So now let's, because we now we have touched upon that we have minimized the bandwidth usage in extreme WAN and for this condition. So now let's look at the bandwidth usage. So here I have presented or shown here is the, on the Y axis, the normalized bandwidth usage. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have significantly reduced the bandwidth usage in almost all network conditions. So as you can see in LAN, we are about seeing 75% bandwidth improvement. And as well as in WAN and extreme WAN, we are seeing about 70 to 75% in bandwidth improvement. So that's huge. So what does this mean to you? This means that 
you can consolidate or you can support more number of users on the same link. For example, if on a same link you are supporting 10 users, now you can support 40 users on the same link. So that's quite incredible with this release. And now also I want to point out another point is that all in View 5.0 with a typical office user workload, we are seeing about less than 50 kilobits per second bandwidth usage for View Planner, a of office user kind of workload. Now let's look at the guest CPU usage. Again on the y-axis I have shown here is the normalized guest CPU usage. The purple color is for View 4.5 and the blue is for View 5.0. And now if you look at while we have added all the new features like client-side caching that Warren and Lawrence talked about and also the lossless codec. We have still, because of all the improvements that we have added on the idle CPU, all the code optimization that we have done, we are seeing lower CPU usage. So in LAN, we are seeing about 10% CPU improvements and in WAN and extreme WAN, we are seeing about 10 to 15% CPU improvements. Even though we have added a lot of new features so we have gone after all the code optimization and then uh, provided this CPU savings. So what does this mean to you? Again, as I talked about, so the previous, we have improved the user experience. We have improved the bandwidth usage. This will save uh, on the host consolidation. So it, you will see more host consolidation. So you will have lower cost for your VDI deployment. Having said that, now let me move on and talk about comparing different display protocols. So in this case, again, the setup remains the same. And for different display protocols, these are the settings we have used. So for PCO IP, we have used uh, internal build of View 5.0 with progressive build, again, uh, BTL off. That means that we have built to lossless off, so it's building up to the perceptually lossless quality. With port ICA, we have used Citrix Gen Desktop 5.0 uh, with progressive build set to default. And RDP, we have used network condition set to whatever network condition we are setting. So now let's look at the results here. Uh, so here we have again showing the user experience or the application response time on the y-axis. The blue color here is PC over IP, the red port ICA or the SDX, and the green here is RDP 7. And again, the results are for LAN, WAN, and extreme WAN. So now if you look at the LAN conditions, we see that there is not much difference in the response time. We are about seeing almost the same user response time in the LAN conditions. If you see on the WAN, PCOIP is providing much better uh, user response time. And if you move on to the extreme WAN, we see that PCOIP again provides better user response time with respect to HDX and RDP7. And RDP7, we find that it's less usable in extreme WAN so it cripples kind of high like video application and high graphics sensitive application. Now let's look at the bandwidth usage. So here on the y-axis I have shown the normalized bandwidth usage. In this case, RDP is consuming the highest bandwidth in the LAN condition. So that is normalized and that's the baseline and everything is scaled with respect to that. So if you look at the LAN condition, we are about 60% better in compared to RDP7, and that is in par also compared to port ICA or STX. If you go to WAN and extreme WAN, we still see that port PC or IP is providing better bandwidth usage or at par usage compared to SDX. Uh, in extreme WAN, RDP7, we see that because web album, uh, like high graphics intensive application as well as video, uh, the uh, desktop is less usable, so we could have seen higher bandwidth in RDP7, but here it's showing less. Now let's look at the guest CPU usage. Again, here we see that HDX is consuming the highest CPU in LAN condition, so that is normalized to one and everything is scaled with respect to that. So again, we see that across all WAN conditions, HDX consumes the highest CPU uh, and PCOIP is providing uh, about 10% CPU uh, savings compared to other two protocols. In extreme when we again see that RDP is showing lower and the reason I just mentioned earlier is that because the desktop is less usable. Uh, so again, uh, what this means is that this can provide better host consolidation for you and save cost for your VDI deployment. 
Now I'm going to switch gears and then give you a glimpse of the multi-VM runs. So we have used a different setup for this. Uh, again, the processor here is a Nehalem processor, 2.53 gigahertz, 96 gig RAM on the box. Uh, clients we are simulating again as client VMs. So it is one-to-one -one, uh, clients connecting to one desktop. Now let's look at the results here. So before I explain the chart, uh, let me give you uh, what metric we are talking about here. So this is the 95 response time. So all the operations that we have collected, so we say where is the 95% response time from all the VM, across all VMs, all operations. So we aggregate that and then take the 95%. So the y-axis is showing that. And then the purple color is view 4.5, the blue is view 5.0. On the x-axis, we are increasing the number of VMs per core. So on, for view 4.5, as you see, uh, at 11 VMs per core, it's about less than one second. The red line that you see is the threshold that we have set. So if the th it is 1.5 second, that means that we want to be at below 1.5 second. The 95% response time should be less than that to qualify a good run. At 12 VMs per core with view 4.5, we are seeing that the response time is going beyond that. So with view 4.5, we were able to support 11 to 12 VMs, Windows 7 VM per core, or 11 to 12 users per core. As we move on to view 5.0 on ESX 5.0 platform, because now we are not only getting the improvements from the PC or IP, we are also getting the improvements from all the improvements that we have gone on the CPU, uh, scheduler, memory overcommitment, memory overhead, as well as on the storage. So it's also getting the improvements from the ESX platform, the vSphere 5.0. So now if you look at the results here, so at 13, 14, even 14.5 VMs per core, we are seeing the response time less than this 1.5 threshold that we have set. But if you go to 15 VMs per core, we are seeing that this, we are crossing that threshold. So with view 5.0, we are almost able to support 14.5 Windows 7 VMs per core. So that's a 30% improvement on the host consolidation. So now that I have talked, given you the, all the results, detailed results on comparing the prior release view 4.5 PCOIP improvements, the host consolidation, let me touch upon some of the best practices that you can do for your VDI deployments. So these are some of the PCOIP tunings that you can do or apply with the GPO uh, with View 5.0. The first one is client-side caching. It's on by default, so leave it default. It will save you uh, significant bandwidth. Uh, build to lossless, it's enabled on by default. Um, and the recommendation here I would say is if for all practical purpose, if you're deploying and running office workloads, uh, you won't see any significant difference between build to lossless, perceptually lossless, and fully lossless quality. So I would recommend that depending on your VDI environment, you might want to turn off this setting, and this will save you additional 30% bandwidth savings. The next uh, parameter I'm going to talk about is the session audio bandwidth limit. Uh, so this is default 500 kbps, and for still usable audio quality, you can set it to 50 to 100 kbps uh, recommendation. And the, this three settings that I talked about, you can set it as default for your pool or for your environment. The next two settings that I'm going to talk about, you can set it as per your network environments. So let's say, for example, you are, have a pool that is for specifically targeting WAN users, or for example, if you have a WAN environment, you might want to set the frame rate setting. It will give you better video playback performance. So default is 30, you may want to set it to uh, 10 to 15 or 12, whatever fits best for your environment. Another setting, the last one I'm going to touch upon is the maximum link rate. Again, set it as for your network conditions. It's good for better bandwidth estimation, as well as it's also good for minimizing the interference across different users. So now that we have touched, looked on the PCOIP to enables, I'm going to look at the bigger picture uh, where uh, you have the whole network and where you can tune your edge routers, uh, your appliance, and as well as the client devices. 
So here, endpoint, we already talked about, Lawrence talked about that uh, in the earlier, uh, that we have added new WMI performance counters with PCOIP so that you can do better monitoring and better troubleshooting for your user session. Then we also have all these tunables that I just talked about. Now let's look at the bigger picture where we have the routers, edge routers, and how you can configure them. So usually we have seen that uh, there is deep UDP buffers, and it can increase the latency. So make sure that in the edge router you have uh, no deep buffering, UDP buffering. You have better queuing algorithms in place. Uh, there is not much minimize, try to minimize the packet loss if you see that in your environment. And make sure that you have proper traffic prioritization. So you have, uh, let's say, you have better priority of PCOIP traffic compared to TCP, but maybe less than voice over IP traffic. And then you have proper QoS algorithm also in place. And then now let's look at the appliance. So for example, if you're trying planning to use VPN, we already have several white papers from different partners that you can use. And we recommend using UDP or the DTLS mode to have VPN connections for your connecting to your remote desktops. And we have, if you're not using VPN, we have also provided a secure way of connecting to your desktops through our PCOIP security gateway, and that, that got released with View 4.6. And there are a few more optimizations that are coming in. So for example, uh, PCOIP traffic can be decrypted and, with, and can also be deduplicated. And this is similar to the WAN accelerator that you get to optimize your WAN traffic. And well-known vendors are working on it, so stay tuned for that. It's coming soon. And after this fantastic, all the improvements, and that brings me to the conclu conclusion slides. So as I said, View 5.0 introduce, introduces significant PCOIP optimization. Uh, band, you are, we are seeing about up to 75% bandwidth reduction for a typical VDI office user workload. So that will means that you can support four times more users on the same link that you were using earlier. We are also seeing improved consolidation uh, because of the ESX 5.0 platform, the vSphere 5.0. We are seeing, and also because of the new PCOIP optimization, we are seeing up to 30% uh, CPU improvements. So now you can support 14.5 Windows 7 VMs per core. Uh, not only that, we have added new features, uh, 3D support, end user experience monitoring, better session resilience. Uh, with that, I would like to thank everyone for attending this talk. Uh, don't uh, forget to fill out the survey for this session. And with that, I would like to open up the stage for questions. Thank you very much. This guy over here had his hand up early, so I want to give him first shot. Sorry. I was just wondering with the increases in the cache and stuff like that, is that going Yeah, currently today in the first implementation, the client side caching only works with VMware View clients. I, I know Terry Dicci's you know, looking into how they can take advantage of that as well. Um, so you'll probably, I'd recommend stop, stopping by their booth and, and talking to them just real briefly about what the roadmap is for adding the capability for zero clients as well. Oh, and just to clarify, um, the, initial, the initial release will not actually support our mobile clients as well. They're similar to zero clients where the memory footprint's you know, really small, uh, but it'll be something that we'll add in the future. We have a question there. Can we take this question? Go ahead, Ness. Um, you can, well, we don't, Vue does not support, uh, whatever Vue broker supports, which is 2008 and supports 2003 as well, you, we support either one. If your AD is different, if you got a totally separate AD, you can import it 2003 or 2008. 